This is a chaotic universe. And so what we need is our faith, our science, our reason, and our art to get us through the day. One of the things that art does is help us focus our attention. And I think one can make an argument that in the 21st century, that's something that we really need. The digital revolution or the digital tsunami is changing industries left and right, changing how we live left and right. It's all about flexibility and, and uh, bending and, and, and working in new ways. It's, there's no rules. We move through a forest of symbols that is created uh, via film and video and now the internet and new media. It's inspiring, um, it's logical, it's irrational. It's art or experimentation that can lead you to the right answers. Disparate ideas will be tolerated. If they're not, the thinking's not gonna go very far. And I think, I think that's something that the arts helps to foster. What we seek in our lives, whether it is in our faith or our science or our reason, is the moments when one plus one equals three. And that's what the arts do all the time. Every day we fail a little bit, and we examine that failure for a little bit of inspiration. It's pretty clear that art is a way of investigating things that we can't easily explain. And there are, shockingly enough, many things that we really can't easily explain through other research methods. And art is a way of tapping into those things that makes us human. This is the role of art. It wakes us up. We have to be woken up. The mortality rate for human beings still stands at 100%. And so what will we do with the time we're given? I was very fortunate to, uh, to be able to do some traveling in my uh, mid-teens and, and, and later, and especially uh, in, in Europe, and uh, you know, began to see firsthand some of the great works. The first time I was at the Rijksmuseum, there was a painting there uh, by Rembrandt called The Jewish Bride, and it's a very tender painting between a bride and a groom. The combination of the tenderness imparted between this couple on the one hand and the light and the thickness of the brush strokes, you really felt there was a real connection. And I think that, <laughs> that was, uh, to me, something very personal. And I almost wanted to reach out uh, and actually touch that robe um, and have a connection to, to Rembrandt as he was creating uh, this uh, scene of light and love. My hope for this uh, uh, building and for the whole area is, is that this is a welcoming home where students can go to learn, uh, they uh, can go and feel it's okay to make mistakes, uh, they can find out more in discovering themselves. Uh, they can turn their own dreams and visions into realities uh, and where they're just going to want to go and create and create and create morning, noon and night. How would you discuss the ways in which those groups are different? Well, this is very geometrical. And these both are kind of the light I see a lot of, but these are like geometry. I think if you asked any faculty member on campus in any field, they'd say that the best learning takes place when students are actually trying to do something themselves. They're trying to create something. And so as they're trying things, as they're learning things, and they're working with another person, their faculty mentor or other students in the class, who are also teasing apart those problems, they're learning in the best and most effective way. Our visual arts faculty are artists and teachers. They're great at doing both, and they actually teach art by doing art, just as our scientists teach science by doing science. You feel like you, you have something deep inside of you that you're trying to make into form. You're trying to make real. And through a series of decisions, this painting, this drawing sculpture, becomes real and it is so satisfying to realize that you made the right steps to make that happen and it's a joyous feeling you know it's a feeling of very deep 
deep satisfaction, a feeling that um, I have expressed to myself very clearly and uh, there was no muddling, there was no uh, second guessing. It is a true statement for right now. I never feel like one totally understands the creative process. You, tr you try to ride it, you know, and you try to be with it. What excites me about animation is that it works. There's this little thing in our eye that allows us to see a sequence of still images in rapid motion, and that will never get old to me. A lot of people, when they hear animation, they think characters, they think 3D bunnies, they think narrative. But experimental animation is more in line with choreography or painting, you know, allowing these things to move in time. Sometimes students have been, you know, they've grown up on a certain type of media, they have an idea of what media should look like. I'm interested in challenging that. I want you to make something that doesn't look like anything I've seen on television. So for students to go through that is important because it is this process of experimentation that could lead you, say, to another right answer. Games are uh, fascinating to me in part because they're a site somewhat set apart from everyday life. And they allow a world to be created by a rule structure that is determined not only by the game designer, but agreed to by the player. To me, that is a, it's an amazing source of possibility because we can, we can try things out, we can act things out, and we can see what, what positive and negative things could result um, from our own decisions, from our own actions, from our own thought processes. In addition to that, we have a, a way of thinking about technology itself and understanding how the digital uh, affects our culture. And those kind of deeper questions about the role of technology in everyday life and the role in technology and culture really are a place where we can get to some deep human questions. And that's, a, that's really the heart of humanities, right, is, is, is understanding what it means to be human. We want our faculty and our students to think of themselves as the best in the world. And to be world-class at anything requires world-class facilities. And when you look at the Black Family Visual Arts Center, you think this is a world-class facility. This demands world-class talent. And the beautiful thing is Dartmouth alumni built this space. When Dartmouth alumni were here as students, they were inspired, they were passionate, and now they want to impart that same passion and inspiration to the next generation of students, and in fact, to every generation of students. When you look around this campus, that's actually what you see. You see the imprint of generations of Dartmouth alumni passing on the passion and inspiration that they received at Dartmouth to the next generation. When I think of, of the real factors that uh, have, have made me love art and have art be part of my life. Um, certainly first I would say was my mother um, because uh, she was and she still is. She's 91 and she's still painting. And I remember even as a little boy and her little studio in our apartment um, uh, was, was next to my bedroom uh, and she would come home every week uh, from the Art Students League where she would be studying uh, with, a, with a group of, uh, of watercolors she had done there. And I would go into the studio and, uh, and we would review them. It was a great um, and enjoyable discipline uh, at a formative age, and so clearly that was uh, uh, w one very important influence. I'd say the second was my aunt, her sister. Uh, she was a, a terrific art dealer, uh, and a very important art dealer back in the uh, 60s and 70s, and that she brought a, a lot of uh, American artists uh, to the fore. Uh, she was always surrounded uh, by, by, by artists and uh, by things happening uh, in, in the art world. On the transformative side, I took uh, actually one art history class, uh, and that was with uh, John Wilmerding. And uh, 
you know, life comes full circle. My uh, second son, who uh, graduated from Princeton, uh, also had John Wilmerding uh, as his professor uh, studying pop art. Um, and he loved him five, six years ago. Uh, and to me, uh, he was uh, just a, a, an eye-opener. When you look for a great professor, part of it is, is you know, that he can give you breadth and depth in a subject, but part of it also is uh, being able to present it in a way that's uh, stimulating and motivating. When I was at Dartmouth, there was no Hopkins Center, there was no Hood Museum, there was really uh, nothing to project the creative arts. When I got to Dartmouth, I started thinking about how I could do what I wanted to do in engineering and art, and I didn't think I could do a full double major. So I actually went to the Dean Carl Long of the Engineering School and to Matt Wysocki, who was chair of the you know, Visual Studies Department, and I said, I'd like to do a modified major. And they both kind of rolled their eyes back and said, well, why would you want to do that? I'm pretty sure that I was the first formally uh, designated modified major in engineering and studio art. It, it's now the most commonly modified major in the engineering major. Theater school, arts, media, I think what it does is develop your eye and I think if you can learn to open your eyes and see things, I think it, it develops a certain awareness of what's going on in the world. As a child, Mark made animated films with his sister. Yet, when he went to Dartmouth, he originally wanted to be a physician. My parents are the only Jewish parents in the world that talk their son out of being a doctor and becoming a television executive. <laughs> Bravo. We all ended up moving to New York and called ourselves the Dartmouth Mafia because we all worked for each other. Many of my early films were, were done with all my Dartmouth friends. Even our Dartmouth film professors sometimes came. Maury Raff, who was a film professor who lived in New York, and I remember showing him, you know, an early treatment for a film and him, you know, nodding and saying, okay, yeah. And then later when he saw his film, he goes, you know, it actually worked. I, I didn't think it was going to work when I read it the first time, but I actually made it work, you know. And we were still getting feedback from our Dartmouth professors. Dartmouth has been a leader in many ways in enormous parts of computing and the visual arts and uh, other elements that come all together to create this community, but they've been over here and over there, and bringing them into one place where they can uh, have their creative dissonance with all the elements to make it as powerful as possible. The single most important thing about the new building is it will bring together the community of faculty and students who, over the past decade that I've been here, have been spread across three different buildings. Sharing the same space is gonna allow for structured but then also organic cross-pollination of ideas between students and then also professors. We really do want to connect these things to see what happens, see what kinds of new discoveries come from those connections with each other. The new Black Family Visual Arts Center is designed in the most wonderful way to make those intersections between disciplines seamless. Dartmouth needs and, and benefits, on my mind, from more places uh, where all those people can come together, and I hope this little pavilion is one of those places on a nice afternoon. I think that is one of the most exciting things about the seminar room to me, is that what you find is in really creative companies, they find ways to force their employees together so that there is an exchange of ideas in a very informal setting. It's not about a meeting to talk about what you're going to talk about. It is an opportunity for inspiration, and uh, with cross um, pollination of, of expertise, and I think that is one of the things that really excites me about this room. My daughter Anna graduated from Dartmouth in 2010, and she was a studio art major. My son Rhett, who died of cancer when he was 21, was a student at Maryland Institute College of Art. He was totally selfless and totally courageous, and, and really it's Rhett that I'm trying to honor with this and, and the way he went about his life. It will feel like a home to students that aren't necessarily seeing themselves as becoming practicing artists because it will feel like a place where their expression can live. I think it was very important to create a whole area or zone or district which said, come here, all of you interested in the creative arts. When you walk up the street, 
and you approach those panels walking up Lebanon Street and you start seeing this color peeking out, you start getting excited. You want to walk faster. What I want you to, to respond to is how the color in the panels work together and work with everything else around it. I think Ellsworth uh, Kelly is one of the giants in modern contemporary art, in minimalism. He's both a painter and a sculptor. I hope that this new piece, which is called the Dartmouth Panels, nice name, nice college, I hope it gives people the pleasure that I get from it. So the Black Family Visual Arts Center has really opened a new door to our campus. When you stroll into the Maffei Arts Plaza, you really get the feeling that you're in an exciting new neighborhood. And it's the kind of neighborhood that many faculty and students are going to want to call home. Dartmouth is committed to the liberal arts education, and we feel this is just another step in the right direction broadening the educational opportunities for the young people up there. Having a leading uh, facility like the Visual Arts Center will encourage uh, students from all sorts of majors, all sorts of walks of life, all sorts of disciplines to come experiment, try, learn, uh, develop. New thinking and, and new ways of looking at stuff can be extremely additive to the community and liberating to the community. The ambition that our students already have uh, is going to be amplified uh, and emboldened in the new space. You want to make stuff. You want to make things uh, in the building. It'll open up the creative process because the process can apply in any discipline. The process can lead to beautiful objects and it can lead to scientific discovery. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what people are going to produce and we shouldn't know what they're going to produce otherwise we would just be coming up with the same old answers. Even though we sometimes commend the understanding or the importance of arts to the outer orbit of Pluto, it turns out to be the bright burning sun of this particular solar system called Dartmouth. I have no doubt that this building is really a marker for Dartmouth. It's a moment. It is allowing us to do something for our students and our faculty that is transformative. And it's going to stretch well beyond the arts itself, it will involve the campus, and it allows us to say that that entire arts district is central to this campus's heart. We as people are only on this earth for a short period. We really ought to enjoy the world and its beauty and all the wonderful things in it. If Dartmouth can help generations of young people who have uh, imagination and curiosity, then I think it's well worth it.